Welcome to Wall Street versus Main Street, a different take on the investment show with our host, Dax White. Dax White is the managing partner of the White Law Group, a national securities fraud, securities arbitration, and investor protection law firm with offices in Chicago, Illinois, and Vero Beach, Florida. The White Law Group has represented hundreds of investors in FINRA arbitration claims against their brokerage firms, and throughout this show, Mr. White will shine a light on some of the tricks of the brokerage industry, while also providing valuable information for investors on how to successfully navigate the investor-financial advisor relationship. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Uh, this is a different take on the investment show. The objective here is not to convey investment advice or or to say, you know, here's the stock that we like this week. Uh, I'm not a licensed professional. That's not the objective whatsoever. Uh, instead, I am a securities attorney that focuses practice on representing investors in claims against brokerage firms. And through that practice, there, there's a, a lot of information that I've, I've gleaned uh, that I have found that investors just aren't, don't know. Uh, and I wish they did, because then maybe they could avoid situations where they would need lawyers like me. Um, and so that's the objective of this show, is to try to pass along some of that information and try to make it a more productive relationship between you and your financial advisor by arming you with some of the information you would need to better protect yourself and make sure that your broker is looking out for your best interests. So each week, that's what we try to do. Uh, if you want to watch us online, visit livestream.com and then do a search for Planet Vero TV and you can find our episodes there and you can you can see me. You can see that today I dressed up. Uh, I did that uh, <laughs> uh, because it's, it's finally cool enough here in Florida to do so. It's been so hot and I, it's been a struggle to put on a tie and a suit, but uh, finally it's nice. And so uh, if you're watching online, I, I, I hope that I look good. Um, Today, the objective is to talk about how long, let's say you feel like you've been taken advantage of, uh, you think your broker did something nefarious, how long do you have to bring a claim? Uh, because we feel like in our practice that, that people are either, they, they, don't, they don't pick up the phone and call because they think it's too late, or they call and they're, they're sort of, well, you know, I, I suspect there's nothing you could do about this, but I wanted to talk to you anyway. Um, and so I think it would be important for, for investors to have some sense of, okay, if something goes wrong or if I feel like something went wrong, do I still have time? Can I still bring a claim? Uh, and there's two, el two elements to that analysis and figuring out whether or not there's still time. The first is statutes of limitation. Each state has various statute of limitations that dictate, depending on the cause of action, how long you have to bring that claim. Uh, and, and it's very nuanced. It depends on the state you're in. And obviously, in a, in a short program like this, there's not enough time for me to cover all of them. Uh, but generally speaking, statute of limitations can vary from as short as a year to as long as maybe six, even eight years. Um, but the important part about a statute of limitation is that it doesn't begin to run from when you made the investment, for example. It typically will begin to run from when you knew or should have known you had a claim. And so in, in many instances, that can be more recently because maybe the investment performed for a while or performed exactly the way you expected. You thought it was conservative. It seemed to be that way. And then more recently you discovered, wait a second, this is not at all what I thought I was buying. Uh, and it's just now become clear to you that the investment was misrepresented to you. Um, so that would be the when you knew or should have known moment. And so, you know, on the short end, you might have a year, as long as three, four, even six years. Um, but it's from when you discovered you had a claim. That, that's when the clock starts in terms of you need to do something. Uh, the second uh, component or the second thing that we're analyzing when we're reviewing cases and determining whether or not we think they are ripe and, and can still be brought is the FINRA rule that would apply. FINRA is the regulatory body for brokerage firms in, in the United States. It used to be called the NASD. Uh, but they have an arbitration forum for these claims. And the reality is if you have a relationship with a brokerage firm, somewhere buried in the fine print is language that says, if you have a dispute with us, you agree to waive your rights to sue us in court, and then you've got to sue us through FINRA. So, that, so that's where these cases are, uh, and that's all that we do is FINRA arbitration cases throughout the country. And the FINRA rule that's on point in determining whether or not you can bring the claim through FINRA is called the eligibility rule. It's FINRA rule 12206. And the language of that rule says very simply that FINRA does not accept jurisdiction if the event, occurrence or event giving rise to the claim is more than six years. 
And the fight that always happens between brokerage firms and investors in arguing the interpretation of that language is brokerage firms will always say the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim is the date of purchase. Uh, that fits their argument because, of course, they want to be able to carve out and say, you know, after six years of buying this investment, you can't sue us in FINRA. Um, th that's not what the language of the rule says. And so it's left open to interpretation to the arbitrators as to how to apply that rule. And the argument that we're generally proffering and, and the one that I have found that arbitrators are receptive to is that the six years, the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim is similar to a stash limitation. It's when you knew or should have known you had a claim. That's the occurrence or event that gives rise to it. Uh, and I think that intellectually makes sense to arbitrators, and I think that's why they generally are agreeing with that argument, is because if you knew you were being ripped off the day you bought it, the day you bought an investment, you wouldn't buy it. If you knew the guy was lying to you about an investment, you wouldn't buy it. If you knew that it was unsuitable for you the day you bought it, you wouldn't buy it. So what is the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim? It's when you realize that it's unsuitable for you, it, when you realize that it's been misrepresented to you, or when you realize what you know that there was fraud or whatever the case may be, but that's generally the fight. Is brokerage firms? It's, it is the one motion to dismiss in in FINRA rules that they are permitted to file prior to a hearing. And so, if you bought an investment more than six years ago, I can almost guarantee you they're going to file it because there's no downside for them. They've got the form already. They pay their lawyer a couple hundred bucks to input your name, you know, copy paste your name into this form, and they take their shot. Um, and so, you know, when we're evaluating cases, that's what we're looking at. And if the date of purchase is more than six years, we're evaluating whether or not, given the facts of your particular situation, uh, whether or not we think we can make a reasonable argument that the occurrence or event giving rise to that claim would be some later event. Uh, and typically that depends on the type of investment that's involved. Um, the majority of our cases involve alternative investments, non-traded REITs, ticks, oil and gas limited partnerships. And, and these are investments, frankly, that the way they're structured makes it very difficult for you to have any idea how your investment is doing. And so you're not going to discover that the investment has been misrepresented to you until years after you bought it. And so in those situations, we generally think we've got a pretty strong argument that the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim is sooner. But 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 that's the things that we're looking at is factually. There, there's a, it, it used to be that it, it, it depended on which jurisdiction you filed it in because there was case law on both sides. There were cases that said uh, in some jurisdictions that the occurrence or event is the date of purchase. And then there were in some jurisdictions where courts said, no, it's when you knew or should have known. And so there was this conflict amongst all of the jurisdictions. Um, but more recently, I think around 2005, 2006, this issue was taken up to the Supreme Court, and there's a seminal case, it's called the Howsam case, where the Supreme Court analyzed this and said, nope, this is a, a fact-based decision for arbitrators to make depending on that case. And so they, they can certainly look to the guidance of previous court decisions, but they don't have to. Um, and so it is open for them to interpret that rule, uh, current, what is the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim. Uh, but there's no bright line standard, and, and frankly, it's it's now open for debate. So in some senses, they clarified the issue uh, by saying it's neither. It's, it's not this, it's not that. But now they've left it so that we lawyers get to fight about this in virtually every case right now. Because the reality is right now, uh, a lot of the cases still are things that came out of the market correction from 2008. Um, people bought these things 2006, 2007. Uh, but they don't discover until maybe 2012 or even more recently that they've even suffered losses, uh, and, and now they're reaching out to lawyers, and so here we are fighting about it. Um, but, but the reality is that what is the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim is, is open to interpretation based on the facts of your particular case. So I'm going to go through sort of what we are looking for in terms of facts and what we generally argue, uh, assuming these facts are consistent with your case. Because, you know, what, what, what the position we're essentially saying is, as I mentioned before, is it doesn't make intellectual sense to say, hey, let's start the clock from date of purchase. Because if, if you knew you were being ripped off at the date of purchase, you wouldn't buy it. So it's not until later. But how can we argue that you should not have discovered that until more recently? Um, and, and, and that gets into the types of investments that we typically are seeing when we make this argument. Because if we're talking about a mutual fund, for example, and the investor tells you, though, this is super conservative and you don't have to worry about risk or anything like that. And then you get a monthly statement a month later that shows a 10% loss. 
and then the next month, another 10% loss, you're on notice that obviously this isn't a conservative investment. Conservative investments don't do that. Um, and so in that context, it would be very difficult to bring a claim eight years later saying, I had no idea I had a claim until now. Um, I, I would think that the brokerage firm would have no trouble saying, well, maybe you didn't know, but you should have known because that's the standard. When it, The standard is, at least under our theory, is when you knew or should have known about the claim. And certainly and under that fact pattern, I would argue, or I think that at least the brokerage firm would have no trouble arguing that you should have known. So typically when we're making the argument that the occurrence or event is more recently, it's because of the nature of the product. Um, and, and, and again, a lot of our cases involve these these very complex private placement deals that are an exemption to the SEC filing requirements. They're typically called Regulation D private placements, and, and they can come in a couple different formats, either a non-traded REIT, an oil and gas limited partnership, an equipment leasing fund, um, a tenant in common real estate deal. There, there, there's a ton of different ways the industry package these things, but but, in ter- but basically the consistency is how they operate, huge commissions, and how investors come to find out about their claims. And the reason that you could own these things for a number of years, and if you own them, you understand it, but uh, for those of you that don't, uh, the the reason that you can own it for a number of years and have no idea that you might have a claim is because unlike a mutual fund where you're getting updates on pricing and you're seeing fluctuations and volatility potentially, that's not how these investments work. I'll take a non-traded REIT, for example. Non-traded REITs, the way they operate is the sponsor of the investment is not required to update the share price until 18 months after the offering is closed. So if you bought it in 2007 and they that's when they first started selling it and they sold it all the way until 2009 before they closed the offering, they would not have had to update the price for you until 18 months later. So we're already into 2010. You've owned it for three years. And for the first time, you're going to get an announcement or a letter or something from the sponsor that says, here's the share price. And in the interim, you're going to get a quarterly statement or a monthly statement from the sponsor that tells you it's worth exactly what you paid for it. And so if the broker told you, hey, this is low risk and it's going to pay income, as long as you're getting your distribution statement and you're getting, or you're getting your, your income and you're getting a statement that tells you it's worth exactly what you paid for it, you'd have no idea that this investment in reality is super risky um, and not at all conservative. Um, and so that is what we argue, the trigger moment, where an investor, once they get that notice finally from the non-traded REIT sponsor that says, oh, just kidding, it's it's not worth, you know, I know that our last statement said it was $10 a share, but now we've been forced by rule to reprice and in analyzing our assets, the real price is $4.50 per share. Um, and that has happened to a number of, of, of the clients that we represent where suddenly they get this notification. And we would argue that's the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim. That's when they would first realize this is not the conservative investment we thought we were getting and that there's actually a great deal of risk in owning this investment. Um, And so factually, that's the kind of things that we look at when we're analyzing these is trying to determine uh, in terms of determining what's the occurrence or event giving rise to the claim. And, And it depends on the facts of your case. But if, if there's a reasonable argument as to why you haven't figured this out until recently, regardless of the six-year eligibility rule of FINRA, the occurrence or event giving rise to your claim, even if you bought it six, seven, eight years ago, uh, may be more recently, and you may still have time to bring a claim. So it, it is certainly worth reaching out and talking to a lawyer about in terms of evaluating, is it still time? Uh, the, the other thing that we look at, there's another argument, another thing that may come into play in terms of arguing that even though I bought it six, seven, eight years ago, the occurrence or event giving rise to my claim uh, is within the six years that FINRA requires, is something called continuing fraud. Um, And and that basically says that if if the broker misrepresented it in year one and you kept talking to him and every time you had a conversation with him, the broker continued to lie to you about how the investment works, how it's performing, um, et cetera, et cetera, you may, that, that continues the initial fraud and allows you to potentially bring a claim many years after you bought it. Um, and, and factually, the, the examples that we typically see are they get, the investor gets uh, that notification that the thing is repriced. They call their financial advisor. They say, hey, wh- what just happened? I just got this notification that says my non-traded REIT went from $10 to $4.50. 
And what we see a lot of times is the financial advisors, oh, don't worry. They're just required to do that, but that's not the real price. It's still worth $10 a share, and you could still sell it for that if you wanted to, uh, and there's nothing to worry about. That would be continuing the initial fraud, because that, that's frankly not true. Um, of course, it's worth the $4.50. It may even be worth less, because that's the sponsor's book value of what they think their assets versus their liabilities are worth. But the true value may be less, because it's really, you know, any investment is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. And there's a very limited market for these types of investments. But the point is that that continues that initial fraud of lying to you about how the investment is working, how, you know, how conservative it is, how it's performing. And it's delaying your awareness of a claim and delaying your actually becoming aware such, such that you would reach out to a lawyer and do something about it. And so if, if, if factually that's something that occurred, you may potentially have the ability to bring a claim many years after you bought an investment. So the long and the short of it in terms of how long do you have is it depends on the facts of your case. Um, you know, the, the reality of that FINRA rule, what occurrence or event giving rise to the claim is that it very much leaves it open to the interpretation of the arbitrators in that particular case. And so you're talking about the facts of your case. Um, and so you, you have to sort of look at, okay, well, what I would suggest at least is, okay, I, when did I buy it? But more importantly, when did I find out? When did I discover that, that I have a claim? And if that trigger moment is seven years ago, uh, for example, let's say the, the investment you thought was conservative and it went bankrupt. And it went bankrupt in 2008, and here we are now in mid-2015. Um, so now you're seven years from when the investment went bankrupt. It would be very difficult for a lawyer to argue that you had no idea this wasn't a conservative investment when you lost the money seven years ago. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a pretty obvious one, but, but that's the kind of things that you need to be thinking about is, okay, when did I buy it? But more importantly, when did I figure, when, when did I figure it out or when should I have figured it out? You know what? This isn't what my financial advisor told me. And if that's within six years, then I certainly suggest reach out to a lawyer and see if potentially it's still time to bring a claim. Uh, because based on the FINRA rule and certainly based on my experience in arguing that exact rule and trying to have these motions to dismiss denied, my, my experience is that FINRA arbitrators are very receptive if the facts of your case warrant it. If there's, if there's a reasonable basis for saying, no, there's no way the investor should have known when they bought it, it's when did they find out, and here's, here's, here's a reasonable reason why they didn't find out till later. So um, th that, that's the long and short of, of when, how long do you have to bring a claim. We're gonna go to a commercial, and when we come back, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, how to file a claim if you wanted to. Hi Mitch. What's that number and who is Mitch? 1-800-HI-MITCH is the number for Mitch Maxfield's Carpet and Furniture Cleaning Services. Serving Florida's Treasure and Space Coast for over 30 years and Mitch still does the work all himself. Call 1-800-HI-MITCH. Mitch Maxfield personally will clean your home or business. Call now for two rooms of carpet cleaning for $77 or a six-foot sofa for $66. Maxfield Carpet Cleaning is a member of the iTex trading community and welcomes your iTex dollars. 1-800-HI-MITCH. Mr. Picky's going to Antwerp again. That's what the diamond dealers in Antwerp, Belgium call John Michael Matthews. Because Antwerp is the diamond capital of the world, John Michael Matthews goes there twice a year to hand select the most beautiful diamonds for his customers. So let Mr. Picky, I mean John Michael Matthews, hand select a special diamond for you. So stop in and see him at 645 Beachland Boulevard in Vero Beach and describe your dream diamond. John Michael Matthews is in the iTex trading community. Your iTex dollars are welcome. Hi everyone, it's Kitty from the Blue Star. Hey, have you checked out our new location downtown on 14th Avenue across from the Community Center and Pocahontas Park? You need to. We now have a full kitchen serving our famous chicken pot pie, along with some new favorites like Creole shrimp and grits, seared diver sea scallops, hand-cut Angus ribeyes, and some of the most creative burgers in town. And as always, we have great live music. Join us for our Tuesday night blues jam or perhaps the Thursday jazz series. I'll see you soon at the Blue Star. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 5 p.m. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Before the break, we talked about how long do you have to bring a claim if you feel like you've been taken advantage of by a financial advisor. Now we're going to talk about how do you actually do it? How do I bring a claim? I, I think I've been taken advantage of. 
Uh, I want to investigate whether or not I have recourse. So how do you go about it? The first place to absolutely start would be finra.org. That's F-I-N-R-A dot O-R-G. And as I mentioned before the break, FINRA is the self-regulatory body of the brokerage industry here in the United States. And so brokerage firms are all registered through FINRA and required to arbitrate disputes through FINRA. And so there's a wealth of information on that website that talks about how to file a claim, uh, arbitration awards. Uh, you can find information about your broker on there. Uh, even if you don't think you have a claim, but you want to investigate your broker, that's where you start. Go to FINRA.org. But that's a great place to start if you do if you think you have a claim and you just want to investigate the arbitration process generally. Uh, the code of arbitration for FINRA is on there, um, and so that that's just a great place to start. Um, the the second place to, to to at least consider starting would be talking to a lawyer. Uh, FINRA is an arbitration forum. The majority of of states do not require uh, that you you have a lawyer if you're going to be initiating of an arbitration case. So in in the context of FINRA, there are actually parties that do these things without a lawyer, and so as you certainly could. Um, but I will tell you that brokerage firms, without a doubt, are going to hire a lawyer. They're going to hire somebody that this is all that they do. They're going to know FINRA better than you. They're going to know litigation better than you. And in my experience, people who bring claims on their own, what's called pro se, generally do very poorly in FINRA arbitration. Um, arbitration is intended to be a streamlined process that would be easier than filing a case in court. That's in theory. In practice, um, other than being in a in a uh, you know a conference room at some hotel or at the FINRA office in a large city in terms of that being your hearing venue, other than it being there as opposed to a courtroom, the actual hearings and the process of getting there operates very much like a court court situation. And so I, I certainly don't recommend that you do it on your own, but you can. And so FINRA.org would be a, a place for you to get the information you would need on how to initiate the lawsuit and what the rules are and what are my deadlines going to be, et cetera. But there's going to be a lot of like ramp up trying to figure that stuff out. Uh, but assuming you're thinking that might be too much for you, Again, I, I would certainly suggest that you consult with a private attorney. Generally speaking, the lawyers that do these types of cases do so on a contingency fee basis, so similar to like a personal injury situation. Um, you, you probably wouldn't have to worry about attorney's fees except for a percentage of any kind of recovery that you might get. It is a relatively small community of lawyers that exclusively do this kind of work, and we usually do it on a national basis because, again, it is arbitration as opposed to court. So... Typically, in most states, as long as you're licensed somewhere, you can come into their state and do an arbitration. So I'm licensed in Florida, Illinois, but I travel all across the country and, and do these cases in, in the majority of states. Um, and so what I typically tell clients is um, certainly if, if, you, if you need to have a lawyer that's down the street from you, you know, do that. Um, but I would think that you would be better served by finding a lawyer that this is all they do. You know, certainly there's a skill to being a litigator, and that litigation lawyer, if the case is big enough, would be willing to read the FINRA Code of Arbitration and have some understanding of how those, how that process is going to work. But FINRA is its own animal, and I generally would tell you that you're better off, um, you know, finding somebody that does this type of work and represents investors and in claims against brokerage firms. Um, but even if you want somebody locally, there are lawyers that do this kind of work throughout the country, and so the best place to find that lawyer is a website called Piaba. Dot org. That's P-I-A-B-A. -A. And PIABA, which stands for Public Investors Arbitration Bar Association, is a bar association of lawyers just like me. It's people who represent investors exclusively in claims against brokerage firms. Um, there's rules that require that you do a certain amount of your practice in that area to even become a member of PIABA. And the website actually does allow you um, to search for the PIABA lawyer closest to me. So... Um, that would be an additional great resource for you to look into if you're if you've arrived at the conclusion that you know I, I need to at least talk to somebody. Um, check that out and try to find somebody that's close to you. Um, that's all I've got for today. Uh, next week we're going to talk about how to pick a financial advisor so that you can hopefully avoid all this mess. Um, if you want additional information on me or on on this show, check out Wall Street v Mainstreet.com and we've got a wealth of information there. And if you've got questions, uh, please send, send us an email and we'll try to answer that in a future show. 
You've been listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. The views expressed by the participants of the program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the White Law Group, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, nor any of its subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.